Hello, and welcome to another edition of B News In Depth. This month, we're all hoping for rain. Most of Massachusetts is in a level three critical drought as defined by the state's Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. This means immediate mitigation practices have been implemented and all efforts to conserve water are being examined and put into place. We're going to tackle the situation in three parts. First, we'll take a big picture look with Energy and Environmental Affairs Director of Water Policy, Vendana Rao, who will explain the different levels of drought and what practices are put into motion as each is hit. We'll then talk to Burlington DPW Director John Sanchez about the current state of the town's water supply and what residents and businesses here in Burlington, Burlington can do to help alleviate the situation. Finally, we'll have a conversation with Burlington Conservation Administrator John Keeley about the impacts of drought on the environment and the plants and animals that inhabit it. We have a lot to get to, so let's get started. So I'm now joined by Vandana Rao, the Director of Water Policy for the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Uh, Vandana, thanks for you for taking some time to talk with us today. Absolutely, thanks for having me. So I just wanted to start off, I know we're gonna get into the drought, but um, just for people who are unaware, just can you tell us a little bit about the office and you know the different sort of um, th you know things that, that it handles? Sure, I am the director for water policy at the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. It's a secretariat uh, with our secretary at, um, as a cabinet level uh, member of Governor Baker's administration. And so at um, the secretary's office, I'm part of the policy team and we look at a whole host of water related issues, including drought, uh, floods, um, water quality, water quantity, stormwater, um, and then there are many other expertise that other staff from our office bring to bear on uh, climate change, climate adaptation, uh, land use, uh, environmental justice, um, and, and so much more. So there's, there's a lot that our office does on the policy side. We coordinate with all our six EEA agencies, which are environmental and energy agencies, and uh, provide grants and funding and, of course, policy direction and regulations on uh, a whole host of environmental issues. All right, sounds like you must be quite busy then. And I know that recently you've been quite busy with the drought conditions and that uh, recently most of the state has been sort of like put into the level three of uh, drought severity. Um, can you just tell us, you know, how is this sort of compared to other recent years that we've seen? So a level three drought is fairly critical, and that's what we're actually calling it, a critical drought. We have four levels of drought here in Massachusetts. So we just have, you know, if it gets worse, there's one more location or one more level to go, which is the emergency uh, level. So this is not a common occurrence. We haven't had this critical level of drought um, too often in, um, you know, going back even 80 or 100 years here in Massachusetts. Wow. Um, the last time we were in a level three drought, um, we did reach that in 2016 and 2020 for some short period of time. Uh, but prior to that, for a 15 year period, we really didn't have any drought of much consequence of a month here or a month there where we had below normal conditions. So it's not, it's not common for us here in Massachusetts to experienced level three drought. And right now, most of the state, I would say 75% of the state is in a level three drought. That is unusual. And how are the different like levels determined? Like what sort of, you know, factors go into saying, all right, now we're in two, now we're in three, mm -hmm. you know, or now we're, you know, even in four. Like what, what do you, what do you, what does the office sort of examine to make the, that determination? So we have six indices uh, or parameters that we look at um, on a very frequent basis to see how they fare in comparison to how they uh, usually fare at this time of the year. So we look at precipitation, stream flow, groundwater levels, fire danger, evapotranspiration, and uh, levels of water in lakes and impoundments. 
So for each of these indices, we have multiple data points or monitoring locations um, across the Commonwealth. And we have uh, divided the Commonwealth into seven regions, mostly around county boundary lines. Some regions have one county, some are two to three counties that have been pulled together to be included in the region. And so each of these six indices are viewed for their, um, are assessed for how they look like in every one of those seven regions. A task force, a um, drought management task force has been set up here in Massachusetts. It's co-chaired uh, by um, EEA, myself, and um, MEMA, and, which is a Massachusetts Environmental uh, Emergency Management Office. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, we co-chair that meeting, and when we are in a drought, we meet on a, on a regular basis, at least once a month, and right now actually we're meeting once every two weeks because the drought is so severe and seems to be um, a moving or changing quite quickly. So we look at all the data, and we look at on the ground impacts of uh, low rainfall and of all these indices on things like habitat, stream flow, fisheries, etc., on water supply, on agriculture, um, and we also look at the forecast. So all of that information comes in and is weighed and analyzed and discussed at drought task force meetings. Um, and a recommendation is made up to the secretary of the EA um, on what um, the level of drought um, is, or um, based on these, based on the on the data for each of the regions. Um, and finally, the secretary makes um, the final declaration of the drought based on the recommendations of um, the drought task force, and after weighing all of that discussion. And I know that you know, as certain drought levels, you know, are declared, different, mm -hmm. you know. Um, mitigation that, or controls are, are put in place. Can you talk about sort of like what sort of like the response is as each level is hit? Yeah, absolutely. So in a drought, the one thing we cannot control is how much water that's coming down on us and how it um, is spread throughout these different indices. But the thing that we can control is how much we are using and how we prepare for uh, a shorter or longer medium term drought. And so the restrictions that are put in place is really for us to pull back on our water use. So at a level one mild drought, we ask um, the residents of uh, Massachusetts to uh, contain their outdoor watering non-essential uses to one day a week. At a level two drought, we ask that they um, all, only put uh, water out in their, um, in their gardens and landscapes through a handheld hose or a watering can and outside of the hours of 9 to 5, which means after 5 p.m. and before 9 a.m. is the best time um, to water because we don't have as much evaporative loss. So right. we can ensure that the water you're putting out on your landscapes really gets absorbed in the ground and goes towards your plants rather than getting evaporated. Um, and then for a level three and a level four drought, um, we basically are um, asking for an outright ban on all outdoor non-essential water use. Um, and some of this may differ um, locally in how they implement it. Uh, many communities have permits that, um, uh, that are given out by our Department of Environmental Protection that have a particular uh, conditions in the permit tied to outdoor water and restrictions and a whole host of other aspects of water supply, but the water restrictions are one of them. So um, communities most certainly should be abiding by those permits and use this broader drought level um, ask as an overlay on top of that. Now, and I know, you know, obviously watering is a big deal and that's sort of like something that the residents and businesses can do. Are there other sort of ways that you work with municipalities during such times just to, you know, maybe something beyond what, you know, residents might be aware of? Yeah, I mean, certainly I, I understand a lot of people's um, strong desire to have um, <laughs> a green, green space outside their home. Um, have green lawns and landscapes. Um, but at a time like this, when there's really not enough water coming down and we've had over six months of below normal rainfall and the months of July and August have been particularly low, um, my message out there is that it's okay to have a brown lawn. 
um, it's okay for us to let go of some of these green spaces for a short period of time until our systems recover. And what's more important to understand is that um, our same water that we use for, uh, for our water supply is also used for fire protection in your town. So when there's a fire nearby, and we're seeing a lot of fires these days, um, especially from um, you know, open fires like in campgrounds about these that are not being put out. Yeah. Um, those seem to last a long time. Uh, they, they burn much deeper. And we use water to put out these fires. And there's not enough water in our streams and rivers because they're drying up or have dried up because of the drought. So the closest place that your firefighters are going to for water is the public water supply system. And if we increase the demand on our public water supply system right now because we're watering our outside grass, um, and they may not have then enough pressure or volume to put out fires. That can be a real issue very quickly. And so I think we really need to be able to understand the connection between our water use and what our towns need that water for other very critical purposes as well. So nobody's asking people to stop taking showers, but take shorter showers, you know. Uh, when you're washing your clothes or your dishes, only do that when the, you have a full load. Don't let the water run when you're brushing or shaving. Remember what, you know, is taught in the kindergartens. They have a beautiful song, I don't exactly. know, my kids did, you know, never let the water run. Um, that has sticks in my mind, certainly, and it, it probably does for many of our uh, younger generation. But, you know, I, I do ask that everybody else also follows that, that same simple yet very effective uh, message. Um, and then on in your outdoor spaces, if you have a vegetable patch, yes, you know, go ahead and and water that unless you have even more stringent requirements from your local water supplier. Uh, but anything else, I would say, just just let it go. And when the, the next um, rainfall we get, we'll, we'll replenish it and um, we should be good to go for at least um, this season. And when, um, you know, when the drought conditions sort of start to worsen, is there, are there ways that the, you know, the, at the state level that you can work with, you know, either like the federal government or are there regional, can you work with other states in the area? Is there anything that can be done just sort of like big picture to kind of help um, mitigate the situation? So right now, um, all of New England is in a drought. So we're certainly reaching out uh, to our neighboring states. We're well aware, especially for some of our, uh, for Connecticut and Rhode Island in particular, we're on each other's drought task force mailing list. We know mm -hmm. what's going on. Uh, we have um, the Northeast uh, Drought Early Warning System, their program, at, um, which is a NOAA program um, that coordinates with all the New England states. And so we are in close touch with them, and we would like to be meeting as a New England um, group in, in another month or so to sometime in September to really start to dig into how we are being impacted, what lessons are we learning, what actions have worked. Uh, how the data looks, et cetera. So we've reached out to our, our partners that work with other New England states to uh, help facilitate these conversations. Um, and at the federal level, um, obviously, you know, the federal level, they are aware of what's going on. Um, there are many other parts of the country that are in a drought, um, you know, have been in a drought for a much longer period of time and have really intensive droughts. New England is um, sort of a new kid on the block, at least this year. Uh, yeah. But certainly, um, you know, fast, fast deteriorating or fast um, uh, uh, accelerating conditions on drought here. So uh, we'll, they're certainly aware of, of what's been going on uh, here. And um, the USDA recently issued a, an agricultural sort of uh, emergency and has um, nine of our counties uh, put into that agricultural bracket so that farmers um, in those counties can take advantage of uh, emergency loan funds that the USDA puts out. So um, we're in touch with, with various um, um, parts of the federal government on this. Right, I mean, because obviously, I mean, watering the lawns is, is a small factor. I mean, I'm sure, you know, like you just said, farms and you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of other industries that are gonna be hit a lot harder by this than, you know, have much more of a deeper impact than you know, not being able to wash your car. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we were blessed with some rainfall this week, and your car is probably looking much better now. Your plants have gotten 
um, that little bit of um, topping um, that they needed to to stay alive and and to thrive. So um, just just look for um, natural replenishment rather than something we would add. And I, the other thing I would like to say is, you know, this the same impact is being felt by those on private wells as well. Um, I do see a lot of times people watering and there's a sign out there saying that I'm getting my water from a private well. Honestly, it doesn't matter. We're right. all getting water from the exact same underground system, um, the same aquifer. If, it's, if, if the groundwater is depleting, which it is right now all across the state, it's going to impact your well as much as it impacts the public water supply. And you don't probably know how much water you have in your private well, right? So let's all be really conservative and careful about how much we're using. And I want to make sure that we're able to get through this period without uh, wells drying out and us having to spend thousands of dollars digging deeper or digging elsewhere to put in a new well because we've dried our well out because we've overused. So uh, please just be mindful and um, put that little bit of constraint or restraint in in your water use um, and and keep it all for essential uses. Right. We're all in this together, essentially. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Last thing, you know, I so I know you said this year is, you know, a little bit, you know, is actually a little bit, oh, a lot more severe than other years. But, I mean, looking forward, is this something that your office thinks we're going to be sort of perpetually dealing with? Is it like a, a new normal or is this sort of an outlier year, do you think? I know it's hard to make predictions of, of you know, along these lines, but there, you know, there are sort of factors out there that maybe could help, you know, us yeah. determine where we're going in the future. Yeah, um, our climate is changing and we have data to show that and we are experiencing climate change here in Massachusetts. So I think we all just need to agree that that is happening. And how is that being manifested in Massachusetts in particular, is that it is changing the way, um, just our hydrologic system, so the, our water system. How much water is coming down, how it comes down, when it comes down, how do each of the seasons look, and then on an annual basis, what's going on. All of that has been changing for the last few decades and is predicted to continue to change. In the case of droughts, the predictions are that we will uh, experience more short and medium term droughts and some long term droughts as well as we move into the rest of the century. Uh, to put it in perspective, since 2016 to now, so in the seven years between 2016 and now, five of those years have had at least five to six months in a drought about five months now. So that's, wow. okay. it is very unusual for Massachusetts to have that. Prior to that, our, the last more significant drought was in the early 2000s, late 1990s. And then in 1982 to 1984 was our previous drought. And then before that was in the 60s. The 60s drought was very uh, severe, okay. way severe than what we're experiencing now. And that lasted between three to five years. Um, so in, in a, going back in our history of 80 or 90 years, and actually we have data going back to the late 1800s as well, um, you, you see some of these times when we're in a drought, but it's not that common here in Massachusetts and in the Northeast. But certainly we're finding that it's becoming, at least in the recent past, has been coming more often. Now, whether this is a cycle of uh, multiple years of, of multiple dry years or below normal rainfall years, and then we'll go back to being normal for some period of time. Hard to tell, um, but certainly our climate models are pointing to us experiencing more of these dry conditions. So I think we are better off, one, accepting that that's happening, and mm -hmm. two, really uh, being proactive and preparing for it, being efficient, making sure we are, especially for things like water supply, do, do we have emergency connections? Are our interconnections with other communities in working order? Um, if, you know, what other sources can we tap? Um, how can we increase the efficiency of water use so that uh, we don't have to look for new sources? Um, so just on the water supply side, on um, uh, uses for other um, sectors, also similarly, we would increase efficiency of use on the farming sector as well. We've been investing as a state quite a bit on providing grants to farmers to um, put in more efficient irrigation systems, drip irrigation, um, things like that. So 
Um, there's a lot that's been done. We've come a long way in our water efficiency than what we were, say, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but there's certainly more that we can do. Um, the hardest hit hole is the environment. They don't have the benefit of efficiency, right? So when there's not enough water, our streams are drying, you know, the fish don't have refuges that they otherwise would. Right. Um, they can't move up and down for for uh, feeding or mating or going to the ocean if they are uh, or coming up from the ocean to breed. So those uh, constraints are certainly there. Uh, tremendous damage being seen right now in the natural environment with, with streams becoming ponds and not having, uh, not flowing um, and, and not allowing the habitat to, to flourish. Yeah, and we actually, in the whole other section of the show, we talked to our conservation commissioner about just you know all the different impacts on different types of wildlife and it's you know definitely a struggle for them but i mean i think the big takeaway here is you, you know we are facing sort of you know these difficult times and i in up and down from you know the individual to the municipal to the state to the federal government everybody's got to be a little bit more sort of you know aware and res act more mm -hmm. responsibly is what i'm hearing you say yeah, and just be mindful, you know, um, and mindful of how you use this really precious resource that we cannot do without. None of us can live without water. And so uh, when we have, um, at a time like this, when it's limited in what we're getting, um, let's just be really careful of how, how we use it. We want to stretch it out. We want to make sure we can get through the season. Um, and um, if, if water needs to be piped in from other places, expenses go up. None of us want to be spending more at a time like this. So um, it, it simple, small steps you take in your own home, in your own daily life can go a long way. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I think, uh, you know, that sort of handles all the, the questions that I had for you. I think we gave a pretty flushed out sort of take on the big picture and also you know what people locally can do and I really appreciate you taking some time I know it's uh, a busy time for you trying to uh, attend all these drought task force management meetings and make sure that everybody has all the has the water they need to live so I, I, uh, <laughs> I appreciate you taking some time and talking to us no thank you for covering this really important topic it, it really helps to get the message out there that one as you said we're all in this together but there are things that you and i can do at, at an individual level as well that can that can really help so appreciate you covering this uh, important topic well we're happy to do it and you know obviously from all for all of us best of luck in handling the situation and thank yeah. you once again thank you richard happy to be here we go now to my conversation with Burlington DPW Director John Sanchez to get the latest on the town's water supply and take a look at how residents and businesses in town can help mitigate the problem. And I am now joined by Burlington Department of Public Works Director John Sanchez. John, thanks for taking some time. Well, thanks for inviting me. So, let's, I mean, just, you know, start off like big picture. Where are we looking at as far as like, you know, right now? I know we're at level three. Uh, you know, drought situation. Critical, critical. critical drought, yes. Um, how does the town water supply look right now? So, uh, so thankfully, uh, in Burlington, the majority of our residents and businesses are helping us by complying with the water restrictions that we have in place. Uh, so, so we are we're pretty low. Uh, yeah. I'm not gonna, <laughs> that, that's a given. Anybody who goes to the reservoir can see that. Uh, but if we continue with this low level of water use that we have right now, uh, hopefully we'll will weather the storm all the way through the end of October. Yeah. And just talk, look, talk a little bit, like, just so people understand, like, how the, you know, the reservoir gets refilled and like, the whole, you know, sort of process that, you know, the town has. So uh, th that's, a, that's a great question. And, and every time we talk about it with, with people, we get the same reaction, which is, uh, which people generally do not know that our reservoir is, is filled by pumping water. It's, it right. doesn't fill by itself. Uh, and like most of the reservoirs, whether it is the Quabbin Reservoir or the Washusett Reservoir, you have a big catchment area uh, and pretty much the water that rains, it, will, it makes, eventually makes it to the reservoir. In our case, uh, our reservoir, we fill it from water from the Shoshin River in Belrica. The only way we can fill it is when there is enough flow in that river, we're able to take some of that water and transfer to the reservoir. Um, so typically in the summertime, when we have an average 
summer like we had last year right. in 2021. During the summer, we were able to pump water every now and then and refill the reservoir so it does not become an issue. During a drought, whether it was 2016 or, or this year, uh, we are not able to do that at all because there's no water in the river uh, that is even remotely sufficient for us to turn the pumps on. So, uh, so our reservoir, last time we pumped any water into it was in May of this year. So, and how does that compare to like other years? Like what would we normally be expecting to see? So, so we are probably at this point about 10 feet below where we normally would like to see it on an average share. Wow. Uh, I think I checked this morning, it was a 128 uh, feet. Uh, we normally see it in the like 135 or up, mm -hmm. you know, because as we use the water, it will rain, we'll pump on water, we'll fill it again, and, and that's a normal year for us. Uh, but with the droughts, uh, all we see is the water going down. There's no way to, to refill it. Yeah. And, I mean, have we seen anything even kind of like close to this in the last few years or the last decade even? Yeah, like I want to say 2016 was a very tough year for us as okay. well. Um, it, however, things have changed since 2016. I mean, we are able to use less water out of the Van Brook than we used to be able to use before. Right. Because we have all the issues with contamination. Um, this year, uh, on the good side, I want to say our, our reservoir, although it's low, uh, due to improvements we made to the reservoir, we're able to run that plant continuously. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, we got about a million dollars to rehab the plant. Yeah. Uh, and that has helped us being able to produce good quality water through the summer, even as the levels of the reservoir continues to go down. Okay. Uh, well, that's good at least. <laughs> that part is good. And also, uh, but, but just to get perspective of where we are, the, the, we have three intakes at the reservoir. Okay. With the top intake, middle intake, and the low intake. So we take water from the middle one. And the reason we do the middle one is Water on the surface tends to be cleaner than the water that sits in the bottom. You know, sediments and things will fall to the bottom. Right. Um, however, uh, because of the drought, we are approaching that middle intake. Within a couple of weeks, people are going to be able to actually see the pipe for the middle intake, which means that now we have to take water from the bottom intake. So it takes more treatment right. to get it to get it to have to meet the standards that we need to have when you take it from the bottom. So. And, you know, I obviously one of the big, you know, projects out there and, and w one of the questions is, you know, like what will happen when we make that connection to the MWRA? So, like, you know, does that lessen the impact that droughts will have? Uh, it, it would in a way. Uh, so we have and, and maybe you have to back up a little talk about the project that we have for the yeah. MWRA because to refresh people's memories, I mean, this project uh, was approved at town meeting in 2018, and we've been working since then, getting permits, environmental permits, construction, etc. And it was always going to be a three-phase uh, project. We completed phase one, and uh, phase one allows us to take about a million gallons of water a day. We've been doing that since last year, so mm -hmm. water has been flowing through that pipe since last year. This year, we're constructing phase two. We call it phase two A because we split it up into two different sections. Um, and that hopefully will be completed by the end of this calendar year as far as the water connection. And that will allow us to have up to three and a half million gallons of water a day. With that in play, we'll be able to abandon the Vinebrook treatment plant, which right. we have all kinds of problems with it. And then a few <laughs> years down the road, <laughs> right, you know, we have the last phase. Now the last phase, uh, we obviously have to build up our uh, reserves because we're paying for this out of the water rates. So we have to build up our reserves to be able to go to the last phase. Last phase is going to allow us to have full redundancy. Again, this is not for a few years, probably three or four years from now. That's when we'll see that project being constructed. But what happens to Burlington? I mean, that's what we worry about. Right. Uh, the drought is going to affect us. Well, the drought will affect us as much as it will affect the whole metropolitan area of, of, of the service area for the MWRA. Now, currently, the Quabbin and the Wachusett Reservoir are the two reservoirs that provide water to the MWRA. And there is plenty of capacity there for several years of drought. Okay. Uh, so that's why you don't see communities inside of 128 going into water bands, because they have plenty of water in the reservoir that they have collected through the winter. Mm -hmm. Unlike us, uh, all the water, all the runoff that happened 
fills those reservoirs over the winter time and springtime. Uh, our reservoir is so small that even though we fill it, it doesn't last us in time. It, yeah, it doesn't like, meet the capacity needs Co- that correct, correct. the town has. So uh, I still see in the future that they will have to have water restrictions, uh, more of the type of every other day, outdoor watering, which is okay for most right. you know, gardens and lawns. Uh, but having that extra capacity built in from the authority will allow us to actually go through summers without the type of emergency that we have right now. Okay. And obviously, you know, so the other thing, I guess, you know, is as we switch over from Vinebrook and the Mill Pond um, and rely more on the, on the MWRA, there's still going to be the issue of the PFAS that are like present in the in the reservoir. Talk about like how that project is coming along as far as the uh, filtration system. Yeah, that's that's a great question because we, we are maintaining that treatment plant. You know, the right. mill pond is staying w- with us. Uh, so we are retrofitting the plant right now. The project is ongoing to build filters to filter uh, the PFAS out of the water. Um, we have divided the project into three different projects to expedite it. Uh, we're buying pumps and pipes from one vendor, we're buying electrical equipment from a different vendor, we're buying the filters from a different vendor, and then we have a building contractor who is actually building the building. Right. Uh, that will cut the project down about 18 months in construction, which is great. So we, our plan is to have that treatment op- operational by the end of the year. Uh, that doesn't mean that the building is going to be complete. Right. You know, <laughs> oh, there will be plenty of things that have to happen until next year. <laughs> <laughs> but at least the filters may be operational. Mm-hmm. And that will, those filters will match the capacity of the treatment plant. So that treatment plant can give us three to four million gallons a day for short periods of time. But that's great capacity to have if we ever had an issue with the other line coming from the authority. So that's the redundancy part. Let's have enough capacity in the town such that if anything were to happen to the single line that is feeding us, right. we still have water to provide water to the community. Which is good. Yeah, it's good so to have a backup. <laughs> that's, that was the whole idea from the get-go. We'll, we'll keep the two systems going uh, so we can have redundancy for us. Now, I know there are going to be some people watching, thinking to themselves, like, you know, you know, I hear all this about the town water supply, but I'm on a well. You know, my house is connected to a well. Why is it the situation as far as, like, watering bands and, and you know, kind of what needs to be done different for somebody who's, like, in that situation? So wells are interesting because we all use the same water. Right. We all use all the right. same aquifer. It's the same aquifer. So, so the Board of Health, uh, in which they're in charge of private wells in Burlington, they rightfully said if there is any type of water restrictions for people that are tied to the water system, the same restrictions will apply to people on wells. Mm-hmm. And, and it makes sense. I mean, it's the same water that goes in the aquifer. That's the same water that... Uh, not only does the, the meadow, the gray meadow and the vine brook, where we take water from uh, when we use the treatment plant, but also that aquifer and that water runs into the Shoshin River, which is a water source for the mill pond. Right. So it is the same water. So this is why uh, people should comply with the same restrictions, outdoor water restrictions, uh, because if they're using that water, it's water that now we do not have the ability to use for treatment and also for drinking water later. Right. And um, so from right now where, like, you know, your perspective, I know this has been a sort of a, an issue at the selectmen, you know, board or select board meetings and such, is, you know, are people complying? Are you seeing a good amount of compliance? And, you know, do you think that, like, it is time maybe to increase, you know, the fees or penalties for non-compliance? So uh, the, the select board, um, I'm on the right track on this one. We had a meeting to go over... Uh, people who are violating the water ban. And, and we see two, two different uh, things happening. One, we have residents and businesses who want to do the right thing. They understand it. We haven't had a drought like this in years. And, and they have turned off their irrigation systems. And then we have, on the other hand, on the other extreme, we have a handful, thank goodness it's only a handful of mm-hmm. people, who uh, just ignore uh, notices, fines, and anything that we may send their way. Uh, so the, the select board wants us to bring him a, a recommendation, which we're going to do that in a, in a meeting shortly, probably in September, if not early October, yeah. for how to change the rate structure, the fee structure, uh, such that it'll make it more 
um, pressure people more into complying. Right. Uh, I have heard people saying, uh, just send me the fine. Right, they they'd, they'd rather just pay it than comply because it's like not that, not that not much. much of a burden on them. Right. Although we had one recently, if I may, uh, you know, talk about this one because I, I find it uh, uh, funny anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, we we sent a, a series of fines to a, a residence and it was in the several hundred dollars, it was like $550 in total. And then the person called and says, well, I thought it was only $100 after the first one. And he's like, yeah, it's $100 for every day. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's not just once. <laughs> so I think that people make those financial calculations at home and they say, well, how much is it going to cost me to pay the fine? So I'm just going to pay the fine until it becomes high. Right. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, there's always a, a point where uh, you know, people will make a decision on whether or not to comply with the rules. Yeah, and then with the possible increase, maybe that decision will be made sooner. Much sooner, correct. <laughs> Much sooner. Just, I guess, you know, as we kind of look in a wrap up, just, you know, your overall sort of take on the situation. I mean, you know, it's good that most people are complying. It's good that, you know, we have that connection with, you know, the MWRA now, even though it's not the full one. But I mean, are you like, you know, confident that we'll be able to continue to provide the, the amount of water necessary for the town of Burlington? So the, the answer to that is yes. And, and obviously we have a short term and a long term. Right, midterm and long-term plans. So, in the short term, with the water restrictions that we have right now, outdoor water restrictions, yeah, we'll be able to make it through the finish line. <laughs> Good. Uh, it, and I'm not saying that it's not difficult. It's going to be difficult. This is not an easy task. But we can see that our projections, the amount of water that we have. I can tell you that from where we are today, because we check on this daily, to the middle intake, we have 50 million gallons of water. We know we use about two million from the reservoir every day. So we know where we're going to be at every given point. Um, but what I see more of, of, of hopeful is that our town meeting, town select board, and others helped us years ago in getting these projects lined up for where we are today. So we see a good you know, midterm project solution, which is the MWA with three and a half million gallons of water. And for the foreseeable future, having that ability plus the town resources as well, that's going to put us in a much better place. Right. Uh, and always in the long term, I talk about four or five years down the road with a, with a long term plan that we have in place. Um, we're going to be able to to totally have a, a you know a good summer. Yeah. Uh, exactly. I, I pray for rain during the summer. I'm well, one of the few ones that are <laughs> hoping rains every day. <laughs> well, we'll be able to actually have summers where uh, it will be okay for it if it goes into a drought. Uh, right. Periods of time. We'll have that sort of backup capacity. Right. I mean, this is this is what we see as going into the future. Um, and if I may add, one thing that you haven't asked me, because so I, I do get asked this question often uh, about, um, oh, we're going to join the authority, one, you know, my water rates are going to go up, and I'm going to pay a lot, because the right. people in all the communities around us pay a lot. Uh, and then I remind them, as well as I remind people who may be watching the show, is that uh, we have been raising those rates for the last four years. Right. Uh, and, so and, most, and most have not noticed it because in average it's less than $10 a year. Right. Uh, so I know it's there, so we've been paying for it. There'll be a few more years of the type of increase, but it's so small that, like I said, most people like they ask me, when are you going to start raising the rates? And I said, well, we already did. <laughs> we have. <laughs> <laughs> we have. Uh, and hopefully, again, it was, it was a good, good plan from that sense on how we're going to pay for it over the 10 year. Uh, Horizon, you know, we'll be able to actually pay for all these projects that, that we lined up for. Oh, excellent. And, I, you know, last thing, you know, so future looks hopeful. We got, you know, the, you know, the projects are in the, are in the pipeline, so to speak. Um, but right now, I mean, beyond not breaking the watering ban, are, are there things that residents can do to, you know, help sort of, um, you know, decrease the strain on the, on the system? Yeah, so, so obviously, uh, I mean, you have a vegetable garden, uh, you know, we're saying you can water it, you know, obviously right. you don't want to lose, uh, your, you know, whatever you planted in the garden. So, so do it during, uh, you know, before 9 a.m. in the morning. That mm -hmm. helps because you're going to use less water when you do it at that time than when you do it during the day. And that helps us because any gallon that you use is a gallon that we need to preserve. <laughs> Um, in addition to that, any other water you can save, I mean, people, uh, you know, they wash cars. So you know what, don't wash your car. Uh, take it to the car wash because, believe it or not, 
the, the water are they use, more efficient? They are more efficient. Oh, okay. Uh, you tend to use a lot more water it, when you have a hose and you let the hose run, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of things that you can do to help us. And if you don't have a project that you need to do now for which you're going to use water, then wait until next year. You know. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, if you're going to paint the house, you're going to have to wash your house before you paint it. We understand that. But if you can wait until next year, that will be great. Same with the new lawns. And we talked about that at the select board meeting the other night. Wait until next year to plan a new lawn if you were thinking about having a new lawn in your property. Right. Um, so this is not the year to start one. Hold off. <laughs> exactly. Look around, see how brown everything is, and just realize it's just not going to work right now. <laughs> not this year. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for taking some time and coming in, chatting with us about this. I know it's something that I'm sure has been, you know, taking up a lot of your time. <laughs> Absolutely. No, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. I mean, it's good to get the information out uh, of where we are. Um, and I will tell you that uh, we don't like doing this. No, no water restrictions. No, I we know don't. watering ban is something that nobody in the town hall wants to wants nobody, to do. Nobody wants to do it. Uh, the reason we do it and the reason we enforce it is because we really have to. So it's real. Yeah. No. So, absolutely. Yeah, thank I mean, you. I, I I always see the look of dread come over the select board members' faces when watering ban comes up, and it's real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So right. again, thank you. All right. Thank you. Finally, we have my conversation with Burlington Conservation Administrator John Keeley about how droughts impact the environment and threaten local plants and animals and how they can adapt to the stressful situation. And I am now joined by Conservation Administrator John Keeley. John, thanks for taking some time and coming down. Glad to be here. So I wanted to talk to you sort of, you know, about the sort of more environmental impacts of, of being in a drought, in a level three drought now. Um, but first, I wanted to just sort of get your thoughts and observations on how, you know, what we're dealing with this year compares to what we've seen the last few years. Yeah. Um, probably about five or six years ago, we had a similar drought that wasn't quite as severe, but it was pretty bad. Um, I don't remember what year it was. Um, but um, I think with climate change, the, you know, they can't tell us, uh, tell us exactly what's going to happen with a the climate, but there seem to be more extreme events, so possibly more severe droughts, more um, hurricanes, you know, that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. um, it's to be expected that we'll have summers like this, maybe not every year, but more frequently than we did in the past. Right, so it could be kind of a trend that we yeah. kind of have to deal with. Yeah, I mean, last summer was very wet, so it's, right. it's not like it's going to be like this every year, but it could be like this more frequently. And I know that this year, you know, we've gotten some rain, but it's come in like very short bursts of very intense rain. Yeah. Um, how's that sort of, you know, different as far as alleviating the situation than, you know, a more sustained, what we to think of like yeah. an afternoon of rain? Yeah. Um, for one thing, when the ground gets dry, uh, the water doesn't infiltrate very well. It tends to run off. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it doesn't get into the groundwater. So it's not recharging the the streams and it's not re recharging reservoirs, it's just basically running off and, and disappearing fairly quickly. But more concerningly, it's the volumes have been so low. We haven't had, you know, the, the rainfalls have been really small. So um, we would need an extended, you know, period of rain, you know, inches of rain over, over several days to, to alleviate this sort of drought. And, um, you know, I was curious to ask you about just the way that these types of drought events affect different parts of the environment. And, yeah. you know, obviously people are looking outside at their front yards and seeing their brown grass, but, yeah. you know, a lot of that's not native. Is it, how do, like, you know, native plant species, you know, react to, you know, situations like this? So there's, there's a few different factors that come into play. If they're healthy, they're probably more likely to sustain themselves through a drought than if they were already stressed from insects or something like that. Um, where they're growing is important. Um, if they're growing in the real sandy soil, um, some plants won't be able to survive. So there will be plants, trees, even trees, that may not survive this because of where they're growing. If they're growing in, like on a, with shallow ledge, their roots aren't able to reach the groundwater, which is really deep at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you have, I mean, you're not allowed to water your lawn in Burlington, but you can, you can do a handheld hose. And so there may be trees and shrubs that you can see that you can see that the leaves are wilting. You might want to give them some water. Yeah. Um, no handheld hoses on the lawn, no. 
Okay. No. <laughs> New rule. Right. right. <laughs> but, but trees, shrubs, vegetables, yeah, flowers, flowers, that sort of thing. Like yeah. that. And, um, you know, you'd mentioned that, you know, the streams aren't being recharged. So how does that impact sort of, you know, fish and, and, you know, maybe, you know, the birds that live on water? Yeah. So for, I'll do the birds first. It's not just birds that live on water. Sure. It's all the birds. So if you have a bird bath, you should keep it full because birds need to drink every day. And if they, if they have to fly five or six miles just to, to the nearest lake or, or a pond or, or a river, um, that's a long way to go. So if you've got a bird bath, um, the birds will come to your bird bath this time of year. Um, other animals, um, so it depends upon where, you know, where, where, what river you're talking about. The Shawshine River and the Vine Brook are not drying up. The fish will probably be okay in those. Um, but a lot of people in Eastern Mass get their water from the Ipswich River water uh, shed. And that is because of all the water withdrawals from all the towns drinking mm -hmm. the water. That, that river is basically dried up for, for large sections of it. And the fish just don't survive. The fish die. Um, and they may survive in pools here and there in the river. And those ones that survive in those pools are the ones that will be important to reproduce. And uh, once the river comes back next year and, and the year after to, uh, to help replace the fish that died. All right, and um, you know now we move on to land animals. You know, um, yeah. you know mammals and other. Or, you know, even I know we were talking when that piece of conservation piece of land was dedicated to the town conservation. You know, there was a vernal pool in there. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's impacted or if that's you know more of a spring activity. Um, but you know, just how other animals would sort sure. of fare in these conditions. Sure. Well, there's lots of um, amphibians and um, turtles. Um, that would get really stressed out in situations like this. So if they're living in a wetland that's totally dried up or a small pond that's dried up or even a brook that's dried up, they may need to move, um, which means they're you know, crossing roads and, and traveling mm -hmm. looking for water. Um, so it's a real stressful time for them. They you know, run the risk of being eaten by something as they, as they look for water or being run over by a car. Um, and other mammals, um, and mammals um, have different strategies. Um, beavers create dams and, and provide water, and that's actually beaver dams and beaver ponds are a great source of water for a lot of wildlife during droughts where they can't find water in other places. In Burlington, that's not so much an issue. Um, where we have beaver dams, they're probably more of a problem. We tend to get rid of them. But in other areas, you know, where there's more, more open country, um, beaver ponds are you know, life-saving for a lot of animals. And when you, you know, from a conservation perspective, is there much that, you know, we as humans can do to impact the situation? Like maybe, I don't know if it's different during a drought and then maybe afterwards. I know, you know, obviously we could restock fish supplies, but, you know, is there really much that people can do? Um, well, I mean, water conservation is the biggie, and I know you're talking to other people from the town about the water conservation, yeah. but it's really critical. I mean, Burlington's water supply doesn't impact rivers to the effect that some other towns do, where they have wells that are right next to the rivers that, that really dry up the rivers. But even so, um, conservation is, is probably the biggest thing that people can do to, to keep the, the water in the wetlands and in the rivers. Yeah, just try to use as, yeah. little, as little water as, as yeah. possible. And once the drought's over, it's just nature takes its course. Nature will rebound. And there's been droughts in the past. There'll be droughts in the future. Um, you know, the populations of creatures may may drop. You know, some in some cases, you know, dramatically, but they'll bounce back. And is that something that's really monitored closely? Um, so it depends upon where you're talking about. In some areas, they certainly monitor fish populations. Um, there's people who monitor endangered species populations. But um, I'm not aware of anything going on in this immediate vicinity, though. Yeah, as far as like, yeah. um, like wildlife reserves sort of keeping tabs on things. Right. Um, so is there any sort of other sort of you know, immediate impacts that you know, come to mind that people you know, should probably be aware of? Um, Any increase in like the potential for fire? Right. So you know, definitely the the risks of fire are really high. So we don't allow fires in our conservation areas. We don't allow campfires. Mm -hmm. Camp, um, and uh, 
certainly urge people not to have you know illegal campfires. Um, the the woods the woods are really dry. Everything's really dry. The the soil is dry. The plants are dry. Trees are actually starting to drop leaves um, as a, as a result of stress from the drought. So um, I don't I'm not sure if we've had any issues yet, but it's inevitable that the region will have severe wildfires this fall, and not severe on the scale of California or something. Right, of course. But still, um, I, actually, I just heard about one yesterday in, in Saugus, in, um, uh, in a state park there in Saugus. So it, that sort of thing is going to happen, and um, I would urge people to be careful and not, not to have fires. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess, you know, if we don't see a lot of significant rainfall, you know, this throughout the rest of the summer, um, you know, d does the effect of like maybe some good snowfall in the winter pretty much have the same regenerative effect that, you know, rain would have? Um, yeah, it'll be too late for a lot of plants for this year. People, people are going to lose plants in their yards, whether they're decorative plants or, or trees and shrubs that are just stressed. Um, but the water table will, will bounce back either through fall rains or if we get heavy snows, the snow melt will, will do the same thing. I mean, basically, the water table needs to come up higher, um, and so that the, the plants' roots can re the, reach the water. Um, so that can that can happen anytime. Snow melt is actually better because it happens slower and, and more mm -hmm. of it infiltrates into the ground. Whereas lots of times during a heavy rain, a lot of it doesn't go, sink into the ground. It'll run off, run off down the street into a storm drain or something, and then into a brook, which very quickly ends up in the ocean. Right, so actually that, it's like what we talked about with the, you know, the quick, sudden, heavy rains and versus the slower ones. It's yeah. the sort of, the more time, the better to sort of help yeah. things kind of yeah. re get restored. Exactly. All right. Well, I think we had a little lightning, lightning round, but I think we went through all the, all the points that I was thinking of hitting. So, I mean, just to recap, you know, you know animals will probably mostly find a way to make it through this, but people should be careful with their water consumption and no fires. Right. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thanks for taking some time. Thanks, Rich. So there you have it, an in-depth look at the current state of drought in the region, its implication, and how residents can change their behavior to help the situation. One big takeaway is that grass is just grass and adhering to the watering ban goes a long way to ensure the town has sufficient water for drinking, bathing, and fighting fires. I'd like to thank my guests, Energy and Environmental Affairs Director of Water Policy, Vendana Rao, DPW Director John Sanchez, and Conservation Administrator John Keeley. I'd also like to thank all of you for watching. We'll be back with another edition of B News In Depth soon, so stay tuned.